Well, welcome everyone to A. Carver Library's Program in Invasive Species, which is an important topic that we all need to know about as we enter spring. And we have Lydia here. Lydia is our Village Environmental and Sustainability <laughs> Coordinator, uh, our invasive species expert for the Village of A. Carver. And she's going to introduce our other um, speaker today. She's going to lead. I'm just going to be listening and learning today. So Lydia, I'll let you take over. All right, sounds good. So with us, we have Sam Coyen. She works with the Door County Soil and Water as a county, conser county conservationist. Say that 10 times fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's also the lead coordinator for the Door County Invasive Species Team. So Sam, if you um, feel like you want to add any more about what the CIS does, or if we're going to cover that in the presentation. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sam Coyne. Uh, you're going to be listening to me for the next little bit. Uh, I work here in the county with Door County Soil and Water, and um, I help coordinate different invasive species efforts across throughout the county. Uh, and kind of facilitate, we have several uh, seasonals who we take on and every summer we go out and we do inventory efforts along with a lot of different control efforts. And so we'll get into that today in a little bit more detail and we'll also introduce the Door County Invasive Species Team and talk about that. So without further ado, unless you guys have anything else you'd like to add, I'm gonna start. All right. So, um, as you know, you're attending the Invasive Species Talk here in, well, I guess, in your home. Uh, and this is in conjunction with uh, the Village of Egg Harbor. Um, so what we'll be covering today, we're gonna talk about what the Door County Invasive Species Team is, that's the CIST, um, that's our acronym. And then we're also gonna talk about what is an invasive species? Why do we care about them? What are their impacts? And are there prevention steps that we can take? We're also gonna talk about invasive species identification and kind of plant ID 101. Um, and we're also gonna talk about winter plant ID. I know we're kind of reaching that point where spring is right now, like right upon us, but uh, it's still nice to touch on different winter ID and. Uh, thinking about the spring. Uh, we're also going to touch on how to report different invasive species that you identify. And then we're going to talk about control efforts. Uh, this will cover best management practices. We're going to talk about chemical and mechanical, uh, mechanical control efforts. And then we're also going to talk about kind of what considerations are important to take in when you're talking about control. And then we're going to talk about overall the county's 2021 projects and what's taking place. And then we're also going to touch on the resources readily available uh, to you as members of the public. So what is the Door County Invasive Species Team? It's a collaboration of nonprofits, state and federal agencies, uh, dedicated landowners, different associations, all with the same goal of preventing and controlling invasive species here in Door County. Um, Door County uh, the Door County Invasive Species Team offers countywide education and control efforts. And our primary goal is to provide the information, tools, and skills to tackle invasives. Um, and so that's kind of a brief outline. As you can tell, we have a lot of fantastic partners who participate in our efforts. Um, and the Village of Egg Harbor is one of them. So when we talk about invasives, the first kind of question that always comes up is, what is an invasive species? As you can guess, it's going to be a non-native species, and it has to negatively impact economy, environment, or human health. Um, there are many examples of plants and animals that aren't native, but they don't have a negative impact, and therefore we don't deem them as invasive. Um, there are plenty instances, as I'm sure all of you are aware of, of plants that are non-native and have huge negative impacts to our economy, environment, and human health. Um, and those are our invasive species. Um, so when we're talking about invasives and we talk about kind of the negative impacts to ecology, what does that actually look like? Currently, 42% of the species listed in the Endangered Species Act are threatened by invasive species. And so here in Door County, one of our many uh, 
I guess our one of our prized possessions for endangered species is the emerald. Um, oh my gosh, the emerald dragonfly. Uh, and so when we're talking about that, it has a codependent relationship with our native crayfish. And so one of the things that can become really problematic is with the introduction of invasive crayfish, so, such as the rusty crayfish or even um, the red swamp crayfish, they can outcompete our native crayfish and result in removing that species from the food web. And by removing it, you end up removing kind of the environmental engineer that allows these dragonflies to actually live and thrive. Um, and so, as you can tell, it becomes kind of a complicated relationship. And so that's an example of uh, an insect depending on our native species and what happens with invasives. Um, we can all think of particular examples when it comes to plants. And so we'll dive more into those details. Um, invasive species alter ecosystem and structure and function as we just gave um, with our most recent example. Uh, they can modify water and soil chemistry. And so an example of that is when you think of zebra mussels. Uh, I think we've all been introduced to zebra mussels at some point in our life, um, but they are an invasive species in our Great Lakes region. And unfortunately are very common in Lake Michigan and a lot of our inland lakes. Um, and they're filter feeders. Uh, so they increase or they decrease the amount of suspended materials within the water column, which then increases the water clarity, which then allows plants to live in greater substrates and so they can live further down in the water column. And it kind of results in a huge shift in our ecosystem. It also causes sunlight to get further down into the water column, resulting in increasing water temperatures, um, which then creates a smaller habitat for certain fish that are dependent on specific water temperatures. Um, we'll also talk more about zebra mussels and the impacts to human health, health and the way it interacts with Clodophora later on. Um, these species also decrease the diversity and ecological resilience of our natural communities. Uh, we have an example coming up that we'll talk about. And overall, it creates a negative impact to our wildlife and it reduces the habitat for native species. So when we're talking about monocultures and that lack of resilience, um, I'm gonna give like kind of a crude example here, but when we're thinking about people, so we all love food. Uh, we're all here because we eat food. Um, and so you can get food from your garden, uh, farmer's market, restaurants, food trucks, grocery stores, you name it. And you can get a plethora of different nutrients from all different foods, um, and experience all different things. And so um, what happens if, let's say for people, uh, something moves in and replaces that kind of base of the food web? Um, and in this case, for plants or um, in an ecological function, replaces the base of that food web with something that isn't as nutritious. Um, so a lot of invasives, because they're fast growing, they don't have the same nutri like nutrition content um, and they outcompete and become a single source. And so if you think about it, it's like if a fast food chain, a single type of fast food chain came through and took over all of the places that we could get food, we would all of a sudden have become very dependent on this one particular food chain, but we would also not be getting that diverse uh, array of nutrients that we need. And so this further becomes exacerbated when you talk about what happens if that food chain was to close, or for instance, the, the invasive plant, uh, we've become so dependent on it in our system, has a disease come through and wipe it out. You have a whole ecological collapse. And so that's why we really like resiliency. Um, sorry if that was a very simplified example, uh, <laughs> but I think it illustrates the point pretty well. Um, and then we're talking about the impacts to economy. Uh, one of the things that Door County has been dealing a lot recently with is um, emerald ash borer. So in the top right, you can see, this is from the Wisconsin DNR, talking about the uh, assessment of ash trees due to EAB. Um, this is from 2019. It's only gotten worse. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, but as you can see in Door County, we've had less than a 50% decline of ash trees due to EAB. Um, 
and that number is only climbing. And so ash is used or was historically used within the forestry industry. And with the dieback of all these ash trees, um, they're getting a critical hit right now. Um, the other impacts to economy include fishing. So on the bottom right here, um, I know smelt aren't native, uh, but we have three native species like herring, yellow perch, and chubs. And you can see that clear pattern of with the introduction of invasive alewife, kind of the drive down of like herring, yellow perch, and chubs. I know the system's a little bit more complex than that because we also had the introduction of uh, zebra mussels at the time also impacting again water quality. Um, but overall kind of painting that narrative as these invasives come in and outcompete our natives, um, we see kind of that simplification of our food web. Um, and also kind of this impact to our economy and the fisheries industry as well. Uh, and then the other things that they can impact are infrastructure. So the picture below is uh, quagga mussels uh, congregating on a pipe substrate. And as you can see, they slowly choke out the pipe and it becomes really problematic. Um, so for all these reasons, we're really concerned about the impacts these have to our economy. Other species, so not just to pick on aquatics, but when you consider plants, um, plants such as Japanese knotweed can grow in fissures and cement, um, grow through cracks in brick. Uh, it can grow through foundations. These have huge impacts for our infrastructure and are kind of a huge concern when you're talking about structural integrity. Um, and then these plants also can have a huge negative impact to recreation and kind of the access to natural resources as well as the aesthetic value and tourism overall. Uh, on the left is a photo of an understory that's been dominated by Japanese barberry. Japanese barberry, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a very thorny, uh, low growing shrub that also has um, a relationship with ticks. And we'll talk about this in the next section when we talk about human health. But from even just an aesthetic standpoint, I know I don't want to go hiking through any area that's riddled with thorns. And this area seems very unappealing to hike through. Um, and then on the right, there is a photo of teasel, which is another spiky plant that is unfortunately threatening Door County right now. Um, and it forms these dense monocultures, again, very unappealing to walk through or even walk near. Um, and these kind of drive down that aesthetic value as well as access. Uh, when we talk about human health, as I said, uh, I'm gonna pick on zebra mussels some more. Um, zebra mussels, by increasing water clarity, they allow Cladophora to thrive. And um, Cladophora, if you aren't local to Door County, um, you may not be familiar with that really gross scum that shows up on the beach. Uh, but it's been linked uh, with E. coli and a whole bunch of bacteria complexes that can result in impacts to human health as well as our uh, migratory birds. Um, when they forage, they end up dying from specific poisoning. Um, these uh, invasive plants also are linked to other diseases, such as I mentioned, Japanese barberry. Um, Japanese barberry is able to create a microclimate with how close it is to the soil surface. Um, and it results in a perfect condition for growing ticks. Um, and mice oftentimes thrive in there. And they found in recent studies that uh, Japanese barberry is seven times more likely to carry Lyme disease carrying ticks than other plants. Uh, and just because that microclimate setting and the density of which these ticks are occurring in the association with mice. Um, so that's why we, again, really focus in on these species. Other things that we are concerned about is wild parsnip. Wild parsnip can cause severe rashes. Uh, it has a photosensitive um, chemical in its sap. And so when it gets on your skin and then is introduced to sunlight, it can result in horrible burns. Um, and this is uh, just one example. Again, I don't know if many of you have heard of giant hogweed. Um, giant hogweed is in that same family that can result in the same thing of burns and can also result in blinding people. Um, and invasive plants can also result in um, terrible roadway hazards. So as I said, these plants can grow in dense monocultures that become kind of a singular 
uh, capacity in an area. And so when you think of plants such as Phragmites that grow nice and tall and grow really thick and nothing else is growing through there, um, deer can sometimes pass through there and um, it becomes really problematic when you're growing, when it's growing near a road right of way. Um, drivers don't end up seeing deer and it results in a lot of horrible accidents. Uh, so now we've covered why they're bad. Uh, but how do they get here? Research has shown that humans are the primary means of spread when it comes to invasive plants and species overall. Um, so whether or not it's uh, pests traveling with firewood, um, when removing equipment from our winter homes to our summer homes, um, they kind of hitch a ride with us, unfortunately. Um, and there's two methods kind of of how they're introduced, just the intentional and unintentional. Um, intentional introduction are such for like food and agriculture. Uh, wild parsnip, they believe was originally introduced um, because you could eat the tuber of wild parsnip. Uh, and lo and behold, it got out of hand and here we are uh, infesting a good portion of Wisconsin at least and many other states. Um, the other way that they can be intentionally introduced is through ornamentals and landscaping. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, so with Japanese barberry, you can still purchase it at many garden centers. Uh, there are varieties of Japanese barberry that are sterile um, and they're constantly breeding them. Uh, but there are three species currently of Japanese barberry that are listed under NR40, which is the Wisconsin Invasive Species Rule. Um, and these ornamentals, it's really easy to introduce them because we think we're doing good by planting something um, in our gardens, it's flowering, it's beautiful, we're all getting along great, and then it escapes, um, becomes really problematic. Other in, uh, intentional introductions are fishing and aquaculture. Uh, earthworms are a great example. Um, the or the uh, jumping worm is a most more recent invasive species here in Wisconsin and also in Door County, unfortunately. Um, and it's believed to have been part of um, the bait trade. Uh, and so people, when they're done fishing, they release whatever they have and they think they're doing a good thing, but lo and behold, you're actually in introducing another invasive. Uh, and then game animals. Uh, Southern Wisconsin, I don't know if they currently do, but historically had um, wild boar um, and it was introduced as a game species. Uh, again, the glory of the hunt and it's all exciting until it gets out of hand. Um, and so these species can be introduced for like a multitude of reasons. Most of the time the intentions are good um, and unfortunately it just kind of slides sideways. Uh, unintentional introduction is through ballast water. Um, we live in the Great Lakes. Uh, I'm sure many of you guys have seen the large ships pass passing through um, and with ballast water starting to be um, investigated for it carrying hitchhikers um, is becoming more and more of a topic. Um, and as you can guess, it is a primary way of invasives being kind of spread around. Hitchhikers on equipment, um, I'm not just gonna pick on large boats, I'm also gonna pick on small boats here. Um, if you've been in most places in Wisconsin in the summer boating, uh, you'll always see someone, well not always, but hopefully see someone standing around with a clean boats, clean water shirt, willing to talk to you about cleaning your equipment and your boat. Um, to avoid bringing aquatic invasive species to new areas. Um, we can also carry hitchhikers in our shoe treads on our dogs. Um, a lot of these, a little seed can go a long way. Um, and then also improper disposal. Uh, we might have the right, um, our heart in the right place, but we may not be actually dealing with our invasives the proper way. So we may be, uh, oh, I dug up this plant, I just threw it, you know, on my wood edge or whatever, and it turns out that population ends up taking over. So looking at proper disposal methods when it comes to uh, especially plants and uh, unfortunately even fish, carp are another example of uh, a species that can weirdly thrive. Um, carp can live out of water. And um, if you're unaware of that you didn't kill your carp, uh, it can be reintroduced into a new water body. Um, natural disasters such as hurricanes, floodings, um, those types of situations can spread uh, invasive species pretty readily. 
um, as you can guess, it's just shifting water and uh, organic matter around. And then wildlife. Uh, again, everyone's had burrs on them, I'm sure. Uh, and it's super easy to spread seeds around if you're an animal with fur. Uh, so that's kind of how they start moving around the landscape. And so previously I touched on NR40 when I mentioned it, in a, I think in a comment. Um, so I'm gonna to briefly touch on it now. Uh, NR40 is the invasive species rule here in Wisconsin, and it sorts uh, invasive species into two groups, prohibited and restricted. Prohibited are species that are illegal to possess, so you have to control them. Uh, and restricted are uh, species that are illegal to transport, transfer, or introduce without a permit. Um, not all potential invasive species are listed under NR40. Um, but they try to stay on top of it and stay constantly are updating it. Um, also in Door County, we're lucky enough, a lot of our municipalities have adopted noxious weed and invasive species ordinances, such as the village of Egg Harbor. And this allows municipalities to kind of enforce and uh, set up guidelines uh, to help people who want to be good stewards and kind of encourage and provide resources for neighbors who are not as invested. Um, and so that's a great thing that we're seeing kind of take hold in Door County. Um, right now, 11 of our 19 municipalities have adopted such an ordinance. Um, so we kind of have like a brief idea of what invasive species are. We kind of know what rules kind of are overseeing them. We know how they get around. Um, so this is the invasion curve. When you're talking about invasive species, uh, you know, every population is kind of at a different point in this curve. Um, and when you talk about prevention, you're kind of focusing on that first step, that introduction phase. We're trying to prevent them before they get here. Um, and so our prevention efforts consist of doing programs such as this, uh, where we are providing information to the public. We'll also have booths um, in normal years, I guess. Uh, hopefully returning back to that somewhat. Um, our Clean Boats, Clean Waters efforts. We also provide boat cleaning stations. Uh, we have a low-tech boat cleaning station, then also these kind of fancier CD3 boat cleaning stations. Um, I, right now there are four in the county. Um, we also provide boot brush stations. A lot of our partners also have boot brush stations at their trailheads. Um, and then we also participate in social media. Um, everyone needs a reminder every now and again, and it's always good to be reminded that to do our part. Um, most invasive species prevention really doesn't take much. Um, it's just getting in those habits of knowing to check gear, check your dog, check equipment, check clothing, that sort of thing. Um, so now we've kind of covered all this, but how do we identify a potential invasive species? Um, unfortunately, it's not going to be like Little Shop of Horrors where it's going to be a lot of like large talking plants. It's going to be a little bit more subtle. Um, so when we're talking about potential invasive species, we're looking for rapid changes in ecology. Uh, one of the best examples that comes to mind is when emerald ash borers started to move in, uh, people who were kind of butted up against ash swamps, uh, had ash in their backyard, started to notice their ash trees were dying back and they weren't sure why. Um, the other thing that we look for are rapid changes in kind of monocultures. So in the top right here, you'll see um, a picture of a farm landscape and I'm gonna just circle a little patch. Uh, I know it's Japanese knotweed, um, but when you're on, like in your own space, you can kind of be the first detector. What are you noticing that's changing? What's different? what doesn't look quite right. And so when you're talking about that, this is a photo taken a few years later of that patch. It's rapidly expanded and it's gained another patch. Um, and so that's kind of a screaming indicator that something is wrong. That population is spreading, it's a dense map. Um, and so that's kind of a red flag. Uh, the other things that when we're talking about invasives, it's important to consider um, what are you planting? Uh, so when we're talking about landscaping, um, oftentimes we don't really consider, we trust what's being sold to us, right? Uh, and 
when we're talking about landscaping, it can be a little bit more problematic. The bottom right, that photo that just appeared um, is Yellow Archangel and Yellow Archangel is commercially sold at garden centers. Um, and I just had a landowner reach out to me. Uh, they identified that the Yellow Archangel that they had been disposing of every year in their annual planters, they'd been dumping it in the woods behind their house. Um, was slowly taking over. And so this is a giant patch of, they realized it had taken over an, an entire area. Um, and it's really substantial. And so the things that made it really appealing is it was spreading, it was dense growing, fast growing, hardy. Um, and that's kind of all the big red flags when you're talking about potential invasives. Uh, another example of this is bishop's weed or uh, snow on the mountain. This is listed under NR40 as a restricted species and it's still very common in landscaping. And the reason that so many people love it is that it can form a weed proof carpet, meaning that it grows in this dense monoculture type setting. It grows quickly and it can grow under these terrible, difficult conditions. And those are all the things that as a gardener, yeah, that's an easy plant to take care of. But as an ecologist, you start realizing, well, that's not native. And the chances of that getting out and becoming problematic is pretty large. Um, so when you are talking about potential invasives, even if you don't have any plant knowledge, it's important to start putting on kind of your detective cap and looking at what are things that you should be looking for, either when you're purchasing plants or even in your own backyard. Um, so we've kind of touched on, you really just want to know super basics. But let's say you want to actually know what's going on and how to identify it. Um, we're going to talk about now kind of how to identify plants and what are we looking at um, and what are some key things to observe. Uh, whenever you're identifying a plant, always take lots of photos. Note location, note growth patterns, note the time of year that you saw it. Um, all of these weirdly become important. If you can, note if it's nervaceous or woody species, meaning does it have a woody stem or is it a green stem? Um, and then you kind of want to look at the branching and leaf structure and those really key characteristics. There's something that stands out about it. Um, and then there's a ton of ID resources we'll go into. So when we're talking about branching, these are kind of the basic branching 101. Is it alternate, opposite, or whorl? Um, and these get more and more complicated, but it's fine to start out with the basics. If you can even just identify if it's alternate or opposite, that's huge. Um, when you're talking about leaf structure, it gets much more complicated, but even if you can say what it looks like. So when you're talking about pinnately compound leaves, if you're saying, oh, it has fern-like leaves or identifying even what is the single leaf or does it have smaller leaves that, that form a like larger leaf, um, that can be really huge when you're talking to someone or even trying to key out what a plant is. Um, and then noticing patterns. Uh, all this is kind of fun and I really recommend if you're an artist or even just curious, um, trying to draw out what the leaf is can make it really nice for when you're trying to identify later on because you're gonna be picking up on the details that you thought really stood out about those structures. Um, and when you're talking about resources for identification, there's a whole suite of books. Uh, these are just some. Um, there's a ton of different apps. Uh, iNaturalist is great because if you have, um, it's kind of like a public knowledge, uh, you share a picture and a whole bunch of people will respond to what they think it is. Um, and it's kind of a public sourcing, which is great. There's also Seek by iNaturalist. And then there's the Plant, Net, Plant Identification app. Um, there's so much out there. Uh, and there's other resources readily available. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug for the doorinvasives.org website here. Uh, we also have a ton of different information and um, we have links to UW Extension's um, weed identification uh, website. We also have a ton of other resources. So definitely check us out and um, find guides that are right for you. It may not be the most complicated thing, but if it has pictures that are telling to you, that is honestly one of the best things that you can find. Um, so now we kind of have a loose idea of how to identify invasive species. What do we do now? Um, I know it doesn't look like this outside. It's much warmer now. Um, so what do we do now? So like, let's say we're out and about. Um, we may not have leaves on. Uh, so when you're talking about specific plants, 
uh, I always like to start with like, what are the ones that are gonna be easiest to identify? And this time of year, bush honeysuckle is really easy to identify. It has this very peeling sloughing bark. Um, the branching is opposite and uh, it's growing in a low, like low bush form. Um, and you honestly could probably tell too because it's growing kind of these dense pockets. Um, again, it being an invasive, it likes growing in those dense monocultures that we had touched on. Uh, Phragmites is another great one to identify at this time of year. Phragmites, uh, we've all, even if we haven't recognized it as Phragmites, it's this tall uh, grass with these giant plume seed heads. Um, and we have a native and a non-native Phragmites here in Door County. Uh, the native has a sort of high sheen stem and very clear fungal dots. Those are the two black dots on the left photo. And the non-native, it has more of a dull um, comb or stem. And the fungal spots, as you can see, are very nondescript. Uh, additionally, the native versus non-native are, the native has a less dense seed head and the non-native has a very dense seed head. Um, these can be really difficult to identify. And so even if you identify that there's Phragmites, definitely let us know. You can let us know and we'll take a look and see if we can't figure out which type it is. Um, Japanese knotweed at this time of year is also pretty easy to identify. It has these very dark red wispy stems. Um, Japanese knotweed during the summer months looks like bamboo. And during the spring months, it has these shoots that look like very, um, red, weird asparagus. Um, and this is one to keep an eye out for, for sure. If you remember when we were talking about the um, economic damages, this is the one that can grow through infrastructures and we unfortunately have it here in Door County. Uh, and bittersweet vine. Uh, we have native and non-native bittersweet vine here in Door County. Um, this is a vine. And oftentimes you may recognize it from holiday decorations. People use them in wreaths, um, uh, table centers and that sort of thing. Um, but this is unfortunately very common. Um, and one of the key ways of differentiating the native versus non-native is the invasive bittersweet has uh, yellow capsules around the berries that emerge in the fall and hang on throughout the winter. And then also the berries are kind of strung out through the entire plant. So an easy way of remembering this is to yell no at the yellow and also to look for the plants growing so fast that it's all sorts of strung out, hence the berries are all along it. Versus the native bittersweet, the berries are bunched towards the ends of the stems and the capsules are orange. Um, so now we've learned kind of some plants to keep an eye out for and how to identify them. But how do you report an invasive species? One of the ways you can report is using the Great Lakes Early Detection Network or GLEDN. Uh, you can download it. Um, and it has a whole bunch of prompts that you can answer, request photos, that sort of thing. And we get flagged if a report comes in. And so we can take a quick look and see what you're seeing or go out and also do a second um, verification. Another way of reporting is through EdMaps. If you don't want to use your phone, that's totally fine. You can go online and use edmaps.org and sign up for an account. You can also see kind of the distribution maps of particular invasives. Or if you don't want to do that either, you go on the doorinvasives.org website and you can click on that report invasives uh, tab and it will provide you kind of prompts and how to report an invasive species directly to desist. If none of these appeal to you, uh, you are always welcome to send us an email at desist1, or desist1 at gmail.com. Uh, you can always give us a call. Um, and if you want to do kind of a larger project, you can use a Garmin, GP, or Garmin GPS program. We loan them out um, and we can also train you on how to utilize one. And if you're still uncomfortable, definitely give us a call and we can try and figure out the best method for you. Um, and so we've gone through kind of all the steps before treatment. And now we're going to dive right into treatment uh, and talk about kind of the treatment considerations. When we're talking about treatments for invasive species, there's a lot of things that we need to consider, such as is the population prohibited or restricted, also known as do you have to treat it. Remember, prohibited species we have to control. Uh, these are species that aren't common yet in Wisconsin and that we're hoping to stay ahead of. And so that's why they're prohibited and we have to control them. Is there funding available to help control these populations? Um, 
is it just simply finding out who has the funds available or is it going to fall kind of on the landowner to kind of foot the bill and how do we work together so we can all get the outcome we want what are the best management practices for these species? Each species will have a whole suite of different best management practices associated with them. And we'll go more into detail in a little bit on what best management practices are. Um, is the site aquatic? Would it fail the wet sock test essentially? Does that mean if you walked into the site with no shoes on, would your socks get wet? And if so, you probably need an APM permit and you also need to be an aquatic approved herbicide applicator. Are there threatened and endangered species identified on the site, state or federally listed? And if so, how do we mitigate and minimize any potential damages to those species? And is this a population a landowner could handle on their own? All of these things kind of get compiled into all the decisions that we make. Um, and so when we're talking about kind of the project area in which we're working in, uh, you can see this is a project area currently that we are operating and controlling uh, the four priority species, Door County is always targeted, which is Phragmites, Japanese knotweed, uh, teasel species, and wild parsnip. Um, this is a very blurry picture of best management practices, a guide from the Wisconsin DNR. And then this is a picture illustrating kind of different wetland plants that you might see. Um, and then this, of course, is Pitcher's Dune Thistle. If uh, you're a plant nerd and you know you threatened endangered species, this is always exciting to see. Uh, this is a threatened endangered plant we have here in Door County. Uh, when we're talking about best management practices, uh, it's a conglomeration of a whole bunch of information that we take into consideration. So we look at what the DNR recommends. We look at what UW Extension has been doing research on. Uh, this data is constantly changing, and so we also will use adaptive management practices, um, such as uh, the Phragmites Adaptive Management Framework, which is called PAMF. Um, and so we kind of pull all this data when we're coming up with our treatment strategies of how are we going to make sure we're going to have the most successful control effort, and how are we going to minimize any ecological disruption, um, and how are we going to best promote native diversity. So this is kind of a lot of information that we have to consider, um, but it's very much worth our time because it ensures that we can get somewhat of a successful control effort. So as I said, this is a very simplified diagram of what we just kind of talked about, is you have to determine if the site's wet, if it's an upland site. Um, you then also have to secure landowner permission with the lens of if it's a prohibited species, um, it gets a little bit trickier because the DNR wants us to have to do that control effort. And so we work really hard with the landowner so they understand what we're doing um, and we don't really face much resistance. And then we always try to treat the population, again, using those best management practices. And so that simplified diagram, when you break it all out and look at all the extra considerations that we're considering, it becomes much more complicated. Um, so, when we're talking about control, I'm gonna first dive into what is chemical control um, and kind of walk through the different methods that we'll use. So in chemical control, we do a foliar application. Um, this is one of our seasonals applying to Japanese knotweed, an herbicide. And so he's applying to the leaves, it's called a foliar application. Um, cut stump, as you can imagine, you cut a woody species and apply herbicide to the outer ring. Um, and we'll go through this a little bit more in detail because we, um, we were dealing with winter species before. Uh, then we can do hack and squirt, um, which is essentially for very large woody species that are very hard to cut down. You can just hack into the bark and apply herbicide. Basil bark is applying herbicide with an oil to the bottom foot to foot and a half around a tree. Um, bundle cut, uh, this may not be very clear from this photo, but it, uh, in the photo we had bundled up a whole bunch of Phragmites, cut off the top and applied herbicide right to the top where we had cut. Um, it's kind of using the cut stump method on an herbaceous plant or hand swiping. Um, so this is where you are very direct in the herbicide that you're applying. You're using a glove that has herbicide on it to apply directly to the site. Uh, so with herbicide, as you can imagine, there's many pros and cons. Um, cons, it, they're, depending on how you apply it, you can negatively impact, impact non-target species. 
as you saw, there's a ton of different methods. And so each one has uh, an increased rate of um, potential mortality on native species and non-native species. Um, applied incorrectly, it can result in herbicide resistance. It can remain active within the soil for long periods of time. This all depends on the herbicide, some it may not. Active ingredients can become problematic to human and ecological health. I'm sure we've all heard of this. And then the pros, done correctly, it can increase species diversity. Uh, it can also minimize cost. And sometimes it's the only viable option. Um, and so again, we, all this gets weighted when we're talking about our treatment strategies. And now we're gonna watch a little video. Uh, so right now we're standing in front of a common buckthorn. The Latin name is Rhamnus cathartica. And how we know that this is uh, Rhamnus cathartica or common buckthorn is that it has these little spines on it. I don't know if you can see that too clearly, but these little spikes are very common on this. And then the other way of telling what it is is also the like little black pea-sized berries that it gets. And then the bark, it has these very small lenticels or little like polka dots on the stem. The other thing that's really helpful in IDing it is common buckthorn will have this like orangey red uh, kind of underbark and it's really clear and distinct. Now that we've cut it down, we're going to treat it again using the garland or the triclopyr. And we're going to apply it again to that phloem outer ring. You can't do cut stump in spring. This has to do with how plants are moving nutrients and sugars through their system. During the spring, nutrients and sugars are being pumped into the new leaves. During summer, fall, and winter, that flow is reversed and nutrients and sugars are being pumped into the roots. This is why we can do cut stump during this time of year. As I said, we're going to be using this spray container, but there's another way you can apply it is with a buckthorn blaster. You can purchase these at various different locations. And it has this soft membrane tip that will allow you to apply it in a more direct way. Um, we just use the sprayer because of ease and we already have it already pre-mixed. So we just sit through that again. Uh, so now we've kind of like looked at, so that was kind of an in-depth discussion of cut stump. Uh, now we can kind of explore the mechanical options. So these are the non-chemical options that are available when we're talking about controlling invasives. Uh, this includes mowing, um, removal or digging, uh, burning, grazing, uh, manipulation of the environment, uh, so this could be like flood control structures, um, steaming, uh, using kind of a high heat steam to control different invasive plants, uh, covering. So this is consisting of putting down a durable black plastic uh, to kill the plants. And usually this takes a few years. And girdling, um, which is stripping away the outer bark and so that nutrients can't course through the woody species. Um, and as you know, we kind of talked about, again, with this, there's a lot of pros and cons that can negatively impact non-target species. Some methods can result in soil sterilization. Um, methods such as grazing, uh, especially in or near waterways, can actually result in nutrient loading and end up poisoning your water. Um, that can also be problematic. It can also be costly um, and needs lots of time. And some methods can actually make invasive infestations work. There are pros, there's no chemical usage, and it can be effective de depending on the species and method. Um, and so when we're talking about control, oftentimes we look at all this information and take it into consideration. Um, next, we have a video of a uh, mechanical control effort. So 
So uh, here we are with the weed wrench. It's a handy dandy tool to help tie up kind of the smaller uh, woody invasives that you have that you can't really apply herbicide to, or you may not want to apply herbicide. It's a great leverage tool. And we're gonna see how it works right now. The ground's a little bit frozen. So here we have common buckthorn. You see those little pokey stems. You get the teeth of the weed wrench around the stem here. And then it's gonna pry for you to get the roots up. Just doused it a buckthorn. So now we've kind of been introduced to all the different mechanisms that go into control and kind of what goes into our decisions overall when we're talking about control methods. We don't really have a one size fits all. Um, sometimes we'll favor mechanical over chemical depending on the location, size, species and all that. Um, and unfortunately for larger populations, we do have to use chemical. Um, but as you can tell, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it. Um, and I'm always happy to talk with landowners more about what kind of goes into that discussion, especially for their sites. Um, but as we talk about 2021, uh, we have some very cool projects going on this year. Um, we already kind of touched on our prevention efforts, if you remember talking about this boot brush and boat cleaning stations. Um, but we also have a prohibited invasive species effort. Unfortunately, Door County, we have a few populations of prohibited invasive species. And uh, that's again on that kind of early side of the invasion curve. And then we also have um, our priority uh, species. And so if you remember that red map where I had talked about um, wild parsnip, Phragmites, Japanese knotweed, and uh, the teasel species, those are our priority species. And they're now kind of in that containment zone. We're slowly walking them back. And this year we're looking at kind of expanding our efforts. Um, we're expanding to new species and trying to understand what threats are kind of out there. Um, and as you can tell, we're kind of at the, it's gonna be a larger, effort to push the ball back down the hill, but we'll get there. Um, so when we're talking about prohibited species here in Door County right now, we have five leaf acabia vine, unfortunately inventoried in the town of Sturgeon Bay uh, slash Sevastopol. Um, and we're working hard to control that. Uh, we also have black swallowwort that's been identified in Bay Least Harbor. And we've had, I think, two or three years of control efforts going on with that now. Um, we also have uh, efforts, uh, this is a new species we added to the list last year is porcelain berry. Uh, it looks like grape, um, but it has these beautiful um, Easter egg colored berries uh, that come out in the fall. And this was found uh, within the city of Sturgeon Bay. There are several populations we identified. And then uh, Japanese honeysuckle. It's a vining honeysuckle that's non-native. We found that in the town of Sturgeon Bay. And um, unfortunately, the population of reed manna grass uh, that had been treated back in 2017 seems to have bounced back. And so we'll be controlling that again in 2021. Our priority invasive species that I touched on are wild parsnip. This is the one that gives you those really nasty burns with the sap when introduced to sunlight. Um, non-native phragmites. Uh, the tall pluming grass. Remember, we also have native, and so we work hard to differentiate between the two. Um, teasel species, this is that kind of grabby uh, species. It's very sharp and pointy and forms really dense monocultures. And then Japanese knotweed. This is the one where, again, it can grow through foundations and cement. And then our new species efforts. So we're trying to get an idea of how much purple loose strife um, which is a purple wetland invader uh, we have here in Door County and trying to stay on top of it. Uh, fun fact, purple loosestrife was the first uh, real documented invasive species effort here in Door County back in 2001, way prior to the passing of NR40. Door County was deciding to be cutting edge and deal with their invasives and they had released a biocontrol, um, a beetle, the Garrosella beetle, 
um, and it had done a pretty good job, but we still want to stay on top of it. We also are looking to inventory and control uh, non-native bittersweet. Remember again, that has a native counterpart, but the easiest way is to yellow or yell no at the yellow and look for those berries that are kind of sprinkled along the stem. And then another one we're starting to get an idea for is European marsh thistle. We have a feeling European marsh thistle is pretty prevalent here in the county. Um, and so a lot of these efforts were targeting within areas of high ecological high ecological importance. And so we've already done a massive mailing out to landowners whose properties have come up um, and kind of been flagged as having high ecological importance and being highly susceptible to these invaders. But we're hoping in future to maybe be able to expand these efforts to other members within the county. Um, so those are our 2021 efforts. And what resources are available to you as members of the public? As I said, the doorinvasive.org website. And then there's a whole suite of other pieces of information, the Wisconsin DNR, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network. There's so much information out there. And I know it can be very daunting. Um, but definitely feel free to take a look and keep an eye out for all these resources. And as we kind of wrap up, I wanted to leave with an Aldo Leopold quote. Um, I believe last week or two weeks ago uh, was Aldo Leopold week and I thought it was very fitting. Um, and this quote, he's talking about the loss of the wolf and kind of ecological collapse. And when we're talking about invasives, I think this really embodies that. We are trying to build that resilience and hold kind of the space for our native species so we can have a more buffered system and so we don't have a collapse. And so when we're talking about invasive species control, it's not that we're hoping to stop all invasive species from coming in. I mean, that would be the dream, but we know that's not realistic. Instead, we're trying to give our native species enough time to adapt and to be ready for what's going to happen. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. That was great. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Are there any uh, questions on Facebook, um, Lydia? I'm taking a peek right now. The page went away, so I have to refresh. So what was that again that does the burn, the uh, parsley? Uh, the, it's parsnip. Parsnip. I know someone up in Sister Bay that really got a bad burn from that. Yeah, that stuff's crazy. It's really yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are no questions on Facebook. Um, no questions in the chat from anyone on Zoom, unless anyone want, would like to unmute and ask a question, you're welcome to do that as well. So those of you who are master gardeners, this would count as one hour of con continuing education hours that you can record at the UW um, site. So um, for all you master gardeners out there who need education hours. <laughs> <laughs> I did oh, have, I, I came up with two, oh wait, did you got, someone? Got some questions? Oh, I just, I had two that I came up with. Okay. Um, so you mentioned one of the invasives, I forget which one it was. Um, it like, you said you had treated it in the past and it bounced back. Is that common for invasive species? Unfortunately, yeah. Um, most invasives, we try to keep an eye out for if sometimes these plants can go dormant. So um, I'm going to pick on Japanese knotweed again because I always feel like I pick on it. Um, if stressed, it can go dormant up to 25 years. And so uh, if you're applying herbicide and you stress the plant, sometimes these plants will have enough sugars and they'll go dormant and trick you into thinking that you did a really great kill and you're wildly successful, and then a few years down the road, they'll pop back up. Um, and so that's why we always make sure we're rechecking those sites, even if we've had, um, you know, previous years, oh, we haven't seen the population bounce back, we always want to keep an eye out for it. Okay, yeah, and I think one of the things that I've heard a lot from community members is um, the timeline of treating and removing invasive species. Uh, not a lot of folks know that, how long it takes. And what would you say on average, how long it would take to completely treat and remove invasive species and consider it cons successful? Yeah, um, so each species is really different. It depends on the kind of mechanism. Um, so some species like wild parsnip is a biennial. 
um, meaning that its lifespan is two years. It goes through a vegetative phase during its first year, and then its second year goes through a reproductive phase. And so the primary way that spreads and uh, populations stay around is the seed bank. And so uh, when you're talking about this kind of annual or perennial noxious and noxious and invasive weeds, you're talking probably a seven year time scale because you're fighting your historic seed bank, unfortunately. And then if you have a year, let's say, where you can't get out, something happens, you kind of end up resetting that clock, which is really disheartening. Um, but let's say you're talking about a plant like, um, I'm gonna go on Japanese knotweed again. Japanese knotweed isn't known to spread seeds. It doesn't really have viable seeds. It spreads through rhizomes. And so when you're talking about that, um, it can be kind of an unknown, as I said, because that one can go dormant up to 25 years. And so um, you may have three years where you're continually knocking it back and killing it, and you're thinking you're doing a great job. And then 10 years down the road, that population bounces back. Um, so each species is really dependent on uh, A, how are you controlling it, and B, um, kind of what are, the, what are its mechanisms for survival and reproduction? Um, and so each one's really different. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an important thing to remember is that it's not, you can treat it, but it's not all going to have the same response. Yeah. Um, I have two more questions, I think. Um, this one, when you were talking about the chemicals, the chemical removal or treatment, um, could, do you just want to elaborate on like what chemicals you guys use because I know some folks are completely standoffish about chemicals and um, it's important to remove invasive species so do you have anything uh, to sort of say to those people who are on the edge of not using chemicals but knowing that you have to remove invasives? Yeah so um, there's a lot of things to consider and so uh, when we're talking about the lens of um, kind of what we're looking at controlling when we're working with landowners. We also take other things into consideration. You know, is it next to a kid's play park? Is it, you know, like, where is it in proximity? And so um, I'm gonna pick on glyphosate. Glyphosate uh, is the active ingredient in Roundup or um, Rodeo. Um, so we, I think we've all pretty much heard of that pretty frequently. Um, and so that breaks down into salts pretty quickly, unless you're eating it, don't eat it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I figure I should preface that. Um, some people with uh, the rise of, I'm going to go on a quick tangent and then answer your question. Uh, right. The rise of um, kind of the eat it to beat it movement, which I think is a really fantastic movement in a lot of ways. Um, people have been trying to eat invasive species out of existence, um, which is really interesting. But you have to be really careful because these sites, people have been using control methods. Um, for so long, and they do store sugars and materials within their rhizomes. So sometimes these are using specific heavy metals, but things that are in them that can be really toxic. You want to be careful of what you're eating. So um, that's why I wanted to preface that when I said glyphosate and eating. I was like, wait, people sometimes will eat these. Yeah. Um, so if you're wild foraging and you're going to harvest uh, invasives, be really careful of where you're harvesting. Um, and know kind of the treatment history of that site. Um, and I think that should go with being said for any kind of wild foraging, always know where you're harvesting. Um, but so when you're talking about invasive, so glyphosate breaks down really readily in the environment. And so it's life pretty much when it's no longer um, contained, you're talking 24 hours max. Um, and so that one we kind of use as in areas that are more sensitive. So uh, the EPA, Fish and Wildlife, when you're talking about areas of threatened and endangered species, uh, they encourage the use of glyphosate because it doesn't exist long in the natural environment and it breaks down in drinking water and that sort of thing. Um, but when we're talking about um, long con like long-term control, uh, an area where it is out of the way, you aren't interacting with it readily, we would look at using something that has potentially, again, it depends on the species we're treating. So uh, I'm gonna throw that caveat out there, but we would look at using kind of a heavier hitting herbicide such as a mazapir, uh, which is the active ingredient in habitat, which can then persist, uh, it lives within the system with, for six months. Um, 
And so again, you aren't ideally eating the soil out of there. You aren't doing anything, but the longer living that herbicide is in there, uh, it's going to have a greater impact to the root system. So we like using these kind of harder hitting long-term herbicides when you're talking about those more nasty, um, long-lived plants such as Japanese snowweed. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. the chemicals that you guys use aren't like they're pretty like low scale. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's not like you're just like throwing it all on there. No, uh, we so again um, when you think about chemicals, there are some really effective ones out there. They are really fantastic, but they have they're restricted oftentimes. Um, they're restricted because oftentimes they're really toxic. And so we try to avoid usage of those at all costs. And also when we're applying, we aren't applying in like, when you think about um, a large ag sense when they're doing kind of those giant smoke uh, machines yeah. and a tractor, we're applying very directly um, to a site. And so we're applying directly to a plant. We're trying to reduce drift, we're applying in conditions that are deemed appropriate by the Department of Agriculture and Trade, also Wisconsin DNR, and then also according to uh, herbicide labels. And so we're treating in conditions where wind is less than 15 miles per hour, which as you can imagine in Door County is very few between. Mm -hmm. um, but we really focus on uh, utilizing chemicals that are effective, but are on kind of that lower tier. tier. Like you can purchase these technically without having any sort of license or any sort of criteria. Um, that being said, I really do encourage people, um, if you are interested in using herbicides, gain the knowledge, read herbicides, know what you're doing. Um, these things, even if they're, you can buy them commercially, they can be really detrimental. And so make sure you're aware of what, how you're using them. Myself and my seasonals were all certified through the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Protection. Um, we're also certified through the DNR. We work, again, using this best management practices we seek to get the proper permits. Um, and you can actually make uh, matters worse if you're trying to do it by yourself and you're running around applying an herbicide. You can actually create kind of a mutant plant that now is resistant to urban herbicide because you didn't apply, you know, in the right amount. Um, concentration really matters. You don't want to Sometimes when you're applying herbicides, you don't want to burn the plant. You want to do like kind of a slow kill of the plant. Um, so it's really taking in all the toxins and killing it. Whereas um, it seems very counterintuitive because, you know, we all think if we apply herbicides, it should be instantaneous. And oftentimes mm -hmm. you see that instantaneous burn, you didn't get, you aren't going to have a good long-term kill rate. Um, and so all those things are kind of important when you're talking about herbicide um applications and making sure that you're aware of kind of the potential repercussions and definitely reach out to us and ask us questions here at the cyst um, i'm always happy to talk about herbicides um, and proper applications uh, and that being said if you're applying in an aquatic situation um, you oftentimes need to be certified and you need to have an apm permit um, definitely stop and you know give us a call and we'd love to talk to you um, and try and help facilitate any way we can. Uh, we have a list of contractors who work in Door County and we can always recommend people. Great, sounds good. So we'll have um, Sam's contact info and the links that uh, she brought up in the presentation on our websites and our uh, Facebook event. So thank you, Sam, for taking the thank time you. to yes. do call today. Yes, thanks everyone. And uh, you'll be back, I think, next month with a program, right? Or nothing? Um, maybe in month? May, possibly. May, that's right, May. Yeah. We'll see you in May then. All, all right. right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.